Well, we came in, in the fall of 1960, and I really w thought my career as a historian was probably over. I wasn't sure, but I thought probably, because institutions didn't appoint husbands and wives, particularly if they were in the same field. There were, there were rules about that, but I had a fellowship the first year that we were here at the Newberry Library, which is a wonderful collection in Renaissance humanism, which is my area of, of specialization in particular. And I was also asked to teach a section of Western Civ. I guess they were trying me out. So I taught a section of Western Civ at a time when Western Civ was required for all students as a part of the core curriculum at uh, Chicago. And then I was offered a job, a full-time job, for the following, beginning the following year. Well, I thought the students were unusual. I had uh, been, I had been an assistant professor at Harvard before coming here, and the students there were diverse in terms of their intellectual interests. Some had no intellectual interests at all, so far as I could tell. They did all their studying and reading period. Here, all the students seemed to want to be intellectuals. That was different. And here they were all studying the same texts and so on, so they were talking to each other about what they were reading and the ideas that they were coming into contact with. And that was wonderful for a teacher to feel that there was that kind of focus and there was that kind of intensity. Well, A.J. Liebling, and this was in the 50s, wrote for The New Yorker a series called The Second City about the city of Chicago. And he said about the University of Chicago that it was the biggest collection of neurotic adolescents seen in the world since the Children's Crusade. And this view that the college was a very eccentric place and that its students were rather strange, rather neurotic, rather weird, was a view around the University of Chicago that many people had on the outside. And while in the period right after the war, after 1945, there were huge numbers of students in all the universities, including this one, as a consequence of the pent-up need for education. So many people had put theirs on hold and served in the armed forces and the GI Bill of Rights, which allowed people who might never have gone to college to come to college. The University of Chicago benefited from that, as did others. In the case of the University of Chicago, you might have 13-year-olds going to school with 35-year-olds. It was a very unusual kind of environment. And you'd have people who might spend a year and a half here, and then they'd pass their 14 comps, or four and five years here before they passed those. And so there wasn't a thing like a sense of belonging to a particular class in the college. It was more that people felt of themselves as somehow belonging to the university for a remarkable experience. And they went on feeling how remarkable that experience had been. By the time that we came, the college was no longer admitting 13 and 14 year olds. And therefore, and the wave of veterans had basically passed through the college. They were in the graduate school by that time. And so we didn't quite see what the Hutchins College had seen and been, but I felt it and saw its remnants and saw the intensity of emotion that people brought to thinking about it and the ghost, I shouldn't call it a ghost because he was very much alive, of Robert Maynard Hutchins hung over the place in an enormous way. Everything was being compared to how it was done in Hutchins' day, what Mr. Hutchins would have thought. There were a lot of people who were furious that the Hutchins College was being, they felt disassembled. There were many people who were unclear about what the shape of this new college or this newer college could possibly be. And so the university had to think hard about what it wanted an undergraduate program to be. And all that had begun by the time we came here. And there was a new dean who was in charge of that and who was a very intelligent, very forceful 
and very witty man as well, who um, began to put all that into play. Thank you.